to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. There's something fascinating about the human effort to worship the Lord. I was in a class a while back and was learning about uh, music and the different things that uh, people do in an effort to honor God. And, and sometimes those chosen efforts uh, come with controversy or uh, change from those chosen efforts to a new chosen effort in an, er in an effort to worship God uh, causes some controversy. There was a time when uh, there was a thought within the Christian community that uh, that to, in order to worship God, you could only play or sing one note at a time, and you can hear uh, some of those uh, some of those anthems still today. Uh, you know, bum 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 bum. Right? You've rec you recognize that sound, and that came from an era where they believed that that was somehow the the greatest praise of the greatest God. And, and then somebody decided, you know what, we need to expand this and we need to add a harmony to this and do it at the same time. And everybody who believed the other were like, I can't believe you could do that. But it's all in an effort to worship and honor God. What can we do to give God the greatest praise that we possibly can? Here we are today. There was a time when drums was controversial in the church, Brother Wally. Can you believe that? I can't believe you would have drums in the church. Right? Well, it, these are all efforts. These are all efforts. Thoughts and ideas. But really, the background of it, the background of it is, what can I give? How can I give the greatest that I have to God? Right? And we can get all offended about the, the, the controversies of it. But for me, it's amazing to see that even though these sometimes are controversial, what they really are is they represent an effort of someone who has experienced the presence of God, the power of God in their life, and the change, the transformation, true deliverance. If you've ever truly been delivered from something, and there's nothing you'll, no length you won't go to to proclaim it and to shout it out and to celebrate it because it means so much to you. Because God is a personal God. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to read verse eight verses here, verse 20 through 28. I want to speak to you today about arguments, strife, and humility. Amen. Arguments, strife, and humility. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. <clears throat> and so he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But... To sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Pay attention to this next statement. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Dun, dun, dun. Controversy. Strife. I can't believe that they think themselves so special. They even brought Mama Bear in to advocate for their position. <laughs> Man. The disciples. <laughs> One of these young men 
ended up becoming the very first martyr for Christ. Yet here they are, vying for position. But Jesus called them to Himself and He said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those that are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give His life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray Your anointing upon me and upon Your Word and upon our hearts to receive what You have for us today. Lord God, You know every heart that's here. You know my mind. I pray, Lord God, that we would be able to receive what Your intention is in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. You can be seated. In classic mother bear move, the mother of James and John unwittingly stirred up jealousy and discontent among the disciples of Jesus. You see, in a carnally motivated act of selfish ambition, Jesus' aunt Salome, the woman in this verse, wants to secure an important position of influence for her two sons. I'm going to go talk to Jesus. She even gets so into it that she kneels before Him. I don't know about you, but I've never had an aunt kneel before me to ask me of my favor. That would be weird. I know it's in the Bible, folks, but it's weird. She doesn't have any clue at this point that these two men that she's speaking of, her sons, will forever be remembered as powerful leaders in Jesus' kingdom anyway. But not because of a plush appointment or favor of her request. She does not have the Holy Ghost and she's unable to spiritually discern that this is uh, that, that, that this, this is how this is supposed to work. And so she does what she knows will work in the world that she lives. She advocates for her family. She attempts to curry a favor from another family member for her own children. That's the world that she lives in. That's the way that things operate. She doesn't know any other way. But Jesus then says, this isn't how this works. That's how the Gentiles do it. That's how the people outside the kingdom of God do it. They they worry about authority. They worry about position. But this is not going to be the way it is in my kingdom. I know some of you are going, I've seen some things like that in the church. Well, yeah, because there's people in it. But that's not how the true underpinning kingdom of God works. God is the one who sets up and tears down. God is the one who does these things. And inevitably, this caused displeasure among the disciples. Offense is taken. Jealousy ensues. Gossip begins to follow. You know the drill. You've been around human beings. You've been in high school before. Married couple had a quarrel and ended up giving each other the silent treatment. A week into their mute argument, can you imagine that? A week into their mute argument, the man realized he needed his wife's help. So in order to catch a flight to Chicago for a business meeting, he had to get up at 5 a.m. So not wanting to be the first to speak, he uh, writes a note on a piece of paper. Please wake me up at 5 a.m. The man Woke up the next morning only to discover that his wife was already out of bed. It was 9 a.m. There was no way he was going to catch that flight. It had already gone. He was about to find his wife and demand an answer of her failings when he noticed a piece of paper by the bed and he read, It's 5 a.m. Wake up. (laughs) That's the exact reaction I had when I read it. I laughed out loud. LOL. Do you find yourself in strife today? 
Are you constantly annoyed with those around you and you see all of their flaws even though others don't? If you, d- d- don't you feel like others are receiving more recognition than they deserve? Do you feel like every friendship you start just ends up in conflict and jealousy? Do you struggle to connect deeply and meaningful with others because they don't understand you? Are you always disappointed in the lack of commitment to you from your friends if you maybe you feel like you love deeper than others and uh, de- and more than they do and they just aren't good friends are you always finding yourself in some kind of a conflict with someone in the church and are at a loss as to understand why this keeps happening if you answered yes to any of those questions or maybe to any of those questions that I just peppered you with then this message is for you Why do we quarrel and fight? James, the apostle, writes this. James chapter 4, verse 1. I'm reading from the New International Version. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire to battle within you? Your desires that battle within you. I'm going to read that again because I butchered it as I read it. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He's actually referencing something he already mentioned in chapter 1. We'll get to that in a moment. But you want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. And you add, that you may spend it, uh, spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred with God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world comes, uh, becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused it to live in us envies intensely? But, listen to this, he gives more grace. That is why scripture says, he's Quoting the Old Testament, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and he will lift you up. Why do we quarrel? Why do we argue? Why do we have conflict? Why do we get annoyed with each other? Why do we not understand each other? Church, can I tell you that our quarrels with others really, as the Scripture says, don't they really come from the desires within you that already war? You see, our quarrels with others are not really about our differences with each other. They're really coming from turmoil within ourselves. The award-winning film, The Joy Luck Club, perhaps some of you have seen it. One little girl has the capacity in her words to, as she says, see secrets on the chessboard. And this special gift enables her to become a national chess champion by the age of eight. Her only liability is a driven parent who is both envious of her daughter because of the gift and selfishly using her to fulfill her own ambitions for wealth and power. At one point, the girl dares to speak back to her mother, and the woman responds, first by giving an icy silent treatment, then by saying to her daughter, you are nothing, you are nothing at all. You see, the conflict wasn't about the daughter and what she had going on. She was a gifted child but it was about the envy and the jealousy and the feeling of a lack of equality that the parent had towards the daughter. And so strife ensues. You're nothing. She goes on to talk about how those words caused her to feel like the life was just sucking out of her and it was a curse. I had this power. I had this belief in what I'd been given. I could actually feel it draining away. I could feel myself becoming so ordinary and all the secrets that I once saw, I couldn't see anymore. All I could see were my mistakes and my weaknesses and the best part of me disappeared. 
because of the internal turmoil of a mother who felt little. See, this story, the mother belittles the daughter, not because her daughter is terrible, but because she's not happy with herself. This jealous, she is the jealous of the gift. She sees herself as inadequate for not having it. She feels smaller than her daughter and attempts to minimize her daughter in an effort to equalize her own position. Church, can I tell you that we fight and strive with each other because we don't understand our own worth in the eyes of God. Earlier in the epistle, James addresses temptation. He writes in James chapter 1, verse 14, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It's not about what's out there. It's not about what is in front of me. It's about our own desires for it, and we're presented with something that we want. We need to be honest with ourselves about temptation to sin and do wrong. The reason that we're tempted is tempted is because we are human beings and we want what we shouldn't have. You say, "Oh, I got mixed up in the wrong crowd," but yet you were there. You wanted their attention. You wanted that affiliation. We need to be honest about ourselves and where it comes from. Oh, I have this disease, I have that, uh, that, that thing, and it's just too much temptation. No, you have a desire in your flesh that needs God's help to curb it. But we need to understand that that's my own desire. She came on to me, yet you responded. Because the truth is, in your heart, you wanted it. Be honest. Repent and move on. People in a position of weakness quarrel. They argue, they dispute, and they eventually disparage. People in a position of strength who know who they are in God will discuss, perhaps disagree, they'll share their idea, they'll listen to the other person, even if they disagree, and they look to convince the other person of their own position because they believe it, but they do it without ugliness, and they do it without name-calling, and they perhaps find common ground. Why? Because they are not in a position of personal weakness and inadequacy. See, when we feel weak, when we feel little, when we feel like we're not worth anything, we have to be right. Because if we're not, then that somehow indicates a lack of something in us. And so then we fight and we argue and we get ourselves into this strife and conflict. And you know what? If we understand who we are in God, we understand we're a child of God and they're a child of God, then even if we disagree about something, it's okay. Amen? Some of you even like Southern Gospel music. I don't know how that works, but... Good for you. Listen to it as much as you want. If it inspires you, it doesn't inspire me. Please don't give me your tapes. <laughs> See, well, it goes along with Southern Gospel. CDs, MP3s, don't share your playlist with me. But you know what? I'm okay with who I am in God, so you feel free to listen to it all you want. <laughs> Praise God. James chapter 4, verse 2 says, You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight, but you have not because you, ask, you do not ask God. Listen to what he's saying here. You want something, but you can't get it. You ask for it, but you don't get it because you're not asking of God. You're wanting something from another human being that they are incapable of giving you. Another person cannot give you self-worth, but yet we seek it in the other people. We want that relationship. We have to be with that person because our worth comes from them. No, it doesn't. It comes from God. You are valuable whether you're with this person or whether you're with that person. You're valuable whether someone likes you or not. Praise God. 
We don't feel beautiful or smart, so we tell those around us who we believe uh, that who we believe are better than us that they're ugly or dumb. We feel wor- little and worthless. We uh, so we find fault in others, uh, so we won't feel so bad. We we feel like we deserve more than we have, uh, so we find reasons to demonstrate the worthlessness of those who have the things that we want. We kill with our words by calling names and belittling those that we feel uh, we don't measure up to. We commit the sin. Of of covetousness by being jealous of the good qualities of others but then criticize those who very qualities in an effort to bring that person down to our level so that we don't feel so bad about ourselves are you getting the picture today church we strive and we quarrel and we argue and we fight and we have issues in our marriages in our relationships in our job situations not because of the other people it's because of us We have turmoil within our spirits because we're asking for validation from the wrong people. When we don't get the promotion, that somehow reflects how little we are. No, it doesn't. You just didn't get it this time. Work harder, demonstrate yourself, and ask God to help you. We commit the sins because of the turmoil. For years, a family, a running family joke was that dad was never, had never, has never met a stranger. We still laugh about it today. We joke and rib him. I remember as a child when we were in a restaurant waiting for dad to join the table. He had struck up a conversation with some random stranger. He was lost in the conversation while the rest of us, more reserved family members, were seated and waiting to place an order. Where's dad? He's still talking. Does he know them? Nope. And we're all looking at each other like, he doesn't even know them. Here we are, starving to death. His own family, his own blood. And he has to be talking to somebody. And we we rib and we tease. And it's does he feel like Why does he have to feel like he has to talk to everyone? He's so embarrassing. As a teenager, you might, we might have thought that once or twice. But the truth is that dad is a friendly and genuinely likes people. Dad has more friends than any of the rest of us and he always has someone to call when he needs help. I also remember having car trouble on the way to a youth service in Bremerton one night. We were stuck on the side of the road. It was dark. There was nobody around. And uh, we were in Gig Harbor on our way to Bremerton with no uh, way to know what to do until Dad remembered a friend from his Air Force Reserve unit who lived in Gig Harbor. (laughs) So Dad called his friend, who just so happens to be a mechanic. And I remember these words, and he's... Uh, he's oh that's his name Mario he's Mario he says hey how's it going I know we've been talking about getting together and this really wasn't what I meant but I'm stuck on the side of the road with my my family and I was wondering if you could help me next thing you know we're I actually can't remember if he was available to come or not but I just know that he picked up the phone and he talked did he come out and help us that night I don't remember either (laughs) Dad had a friend because he's friendly, but he's so embarrassing. I can't believe he talks to everybody. He was so embarrassing. No, actually, he's friendly. And guess what? That's a good quality. And you know what? It's okay that he's friendly even though I'm not. You all know me. I like the self-checkout because I don't have to talk to nobody and they don't comment about the things that I'm buying. All right? But you know what? It's good that he's friendly. He's got more friends than I do. That's probably better. There'll be more people at his funeral, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) You see, we want to be noticed, so we demand the attention of others and we accuse uh, them of hating us when they don't give it. We have a need for validation and uh, we uh, we look for it in those around us, but looking for validation, looking for recognition or affirmation in other people will always lead to disappointment. Church, do you know that true peace, true fulfillment, true joy and recognition can only truly come from God? He said, you do not have because you do not ask of God. 
And God is the only true and complete source of all that we really truly desire. Jesus is the one who created you and He loves you unconditionally. Jesus is the one who will heal your heart. Jesus is the only one who ever died for you. Stop looking for happiness, validation and affirmation in other people and find it in the one who is capable of giving it to you. The creator of the universe, the speaker of your soul, the regenerator of your life, Jesus Christ. So, okay, great. We understand that now, but how do we overcome that? Well, guess what? The Apostle gives us right in this passage exactly how to overcome it. In James chapter 4, verse 4, he says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you not, or do you think that scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely, but he gives us more grace? That's why the scripture says, hear it now, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, sinners. Purify your heart, you double minded. Now, in this language, you might get lost, but can I tell you that first, the first key to overcoming quarrels that I see in this scripture is this little word called humility. Humble yourself to God. First thing we need to understand is that He is God and I am not. I cannot dictate my own life. I receive it as a gift from Him and I live it in stewardship to the gift that He has given me. I am not the the owner of my own life. He is the giver of it. I'm just the steward. That's why I need to be a good steward of this life that's given me. If you were in control of your own life, then you could determine when you have it and when you don't. But the truth of the matter is, is that none of us can. You have no control of the day that you die. Unless you take what has not been given to you and step into the place of God in your own life because you're confused, because you're hurt, because you're discouraged. Oh, look to Jesus Christ. Look to God. He's the only one that has unconditional love to give to us. And He loves intensely. He loves unconditionally. He wants to make you into the image that He knows that you you can be. And so we humble ourselves. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people. We're the sheep of His pasture. Church, can I remind you again that God made you and who and what you are comes from Him. That, that mean, that's why we need to recognize that who we are and what we are, it comes from God. But we're so worried about the inadequacies of ourselves that we perceive in comparison to somebody else who we admire, that it makes us feel little and it makes us feel inadequate. And God is simply standing there in the, on His throne room. Right in, right, He comes off of that and He comes right into your place and He says, you are my child. Everybody get your poker face on. I'm going to ask you a question that I don't want you to respond to. Got it? Okay. You ever had somebody bring their baby to you and say, isn't he so cute? And you're just thinking, yeah. <clears throat> Beautiful. No? I'm the only one? God bless you. I pastor the most humble, the most gracious the kindest people in the whole wide world. God bless you. Of course you do. You love that little baby. You love that little child. A mother, a father, they love their children no matter what they look like. Some of you are like, that was me. You know what? 
That's how we look to God. He made us. He made you. And He doesn't expect you to be His other child. So stop trying to be them. Stop worrying about the favor of somebody else. Recognize, I am who I am. I have the gifts that I have. I don't need the gifts of somebody else. I'm going to take what I have been given and I'm going to use them and I'm going to develop them and I'm going to work with them the best that I can. I'm going to give my best, of course. Okay? So God didn't bless you with a beautiful voice. Then don't be a singer. Do something else. So God didn't give you the gift of of mechanical uh, aptitude. Stop trying to fix stuff. It's okay. Start being friendly and get more friends who know how to do that sort of stuff. (laughs) God made you, and who you are comes from Him. Yet in a sinful world, we have become broken. However, there is only one healer, the Lord who created us. And so we humble ourselves to God. God, I'm not going to tell you that you made a mistake. I'm going to tell you that who I am and what I am comes from you. And so I'm going to be the best me that I possibly can, God. I'm not going to try to live outside of what I am. I'm going to try to do, but I am going to try to do the very best that I can with what I have. Amen. Praise God. I was asked to be... uh, Sunday school director for our church organization. It's funny to, ironic to me because the only Sunday school I had ever taught was as a fill in, like twice. At the time, I didn't have children. I didn't particularly like them. I didn't dislike them. They're okay, they're necessary. I know, I've talked about this before. I've grown, so, you know, I like kids now. But it was interesting to me. I I didn't know anything about it, but I do know how to organize. I do know how to find people. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to do the best that I can. And I was asked one time, and I, uh, I, was, I was made the Sunday school director. I started doing some things. I did what I could. I promoted the department and all this. And I got a phone call from a pastor one time, and he says, hey, we have a children's revival every service. Do you think you could come and you could uh, uh, do this children's revival for me? And I'm like, yeah, I, I, uh, sure. I don't like do puppets or characters or dress up or anything. Like I, I, I mean, I'll do my best. It's like, ah, oh, it's okay. You know what, what? And so we put together, I got some kids from the youth group to help us. And, uh, you know, we, we put this together and it, and it was, yeah. it wasn't that good. I was trying to be something I'm not. I did my best, but I realized this ain't any good. And so what I did is I said, you know what? I've been given this job. Instead of trying to be something that I'm not, instead of feeling terrible about not being what God has not gifted me, I'm going to use the gifts that I have, the ability to find people and put them in the right place, and I'm going to organize, and I'm going to do the background stuff, and I'm going to get people who know how to be silly and you know, cartwheels and, you know, blow bubbles and, you know, sing silly songs, wear funny hats. And I'm going to get them in front of the kids and they're going to do it. And I'm going to give them the resources that they need. And things begin to happen and things were successful. Why? Because I stopped trying to be something that I wasn't. I am who I am from God. And you are who you are from God. And we need to do two things. We need to humble ourselves, recognize what we are. I am worthwhile even though I may not have the same giftedness as you. And it's okay if you're different than me. And it's okay if I'm different from you. And it's okay. We don't have to argue about it. 
Amen. Some of you, I just gave you like a, I just gave you like a weeks long therapy session for marriage. You're welcome. So we humble ourselves to God, recognizing our giftedness comes from Him. It doesn't come from us. And when we have something that is a gift, that is a blessing, that is successful, that is something that maybe we're proud of, we also don't flaunt it around because we understand it's been given to us by God anyway. And when somebody else has an opportunity to do something, we don't sit back and we say, I, I could have done that way better. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. Let somebody else have some glory. It doesn't take away from you. Why do we think that it does? Let somebody else be successful. Amen. So we humble ourselves not only to God, but we under, humble ourselves to our equal brother and sister brother or sister. In James chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Do not speak evil of one another. Brethren, he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. What he's saying here is he's saying that when you speak evil of a brother, when you belittle your, your, your equal brother or sister, you are actually in conflict with the law of God. Guess what? <laughs> Look at the person next to you and say, God made you just as special as me. And remember, you're in church. If you lie, it's like extra worth, extra bad. That's the reality. Amen? Some of you who are married, you need to understand that God made your spouse, your sister or brother in Christ before you were ever married. Yet some of us treat our spouse worse than we would treat a brother or sister at church. At church, it's like, oh, praise the Lord, brother. You're so awesome. I love you so much. Some of you are all touchy-feely and you like the hug and all that. <laughs> Come on. I like fist bumps. And for those of you who need a hug, I'll give you a hug too. That's an equal human being to you. Yes, God loves you. Yes, God has gifted you. Yes, you're the apple of His eye. Yes, He has desires and intentions on you, but He has those same desires and giftedness and love for the person next to you. And so we need to recognize that even though they have the most craziest idea I've ever heard in my whole life, God loves them just as much as me. God doesn't agree with their opinion in any way, shape, or form. That's a joke, by the way. But God is secure in His authority and power enough. Listen to me now, church. God is secure in His authority and power to actually let you think your own thoughts. That doesn't mean He changes right and wrong for you, but He allows you to have your own opinions. It was a, re a mind-blowing revelation to me. I was, uh, I was caught between two, uh, two, two decisions that I didn't, uh, didn't know which way to go. And I was praying, God, show me what's right. And I was wor I'm, always wor I'm always praying about, I want to make right decisions. I, like good or bad, I mean, eh. But me, it's right. I don't want to make a wrong decision. I don't want to be out of the will of God. I, that, that's important to me. And so I'm praying, God, I don't want to go down the wrong path. I want to be in your will. Lord, show me what direction. And God actually said, which one do you want? Yeah, that's the wrong question, God. I don't want to make the decision. I want you to. Because then, if it's wrong, it's on you. <laughs> and you're God, and you're never wrong. So, you know. If it doesn't go well, I'm just be like, hey, God said it. Whatever. He said, what do you want? Because both are fine with me. You choose. God's secure in His power and His authority enough to allow you to do that. Why can't we do that with each other? I'm not talking about right and wrong. I'm not talking about sin and, and, and righteousness. Amen. Praise God.
So we humble ourselves to our equal brother or sister. See, we're all God's children. Not one of us is better than the other. And if we want to avoid strife, if we want to avoid quarrels, if we want to avoid arguments, we need to learn the value, the, uh, learn to value the strengths and the differences and yes, even the inadequacies of other people. Amen. I mentioned my time as a Sunday school director for our, for our church organization and I, I really enjoyed that time. Some of you, uh, know that and, I, I, I feel like I brought something. It was a time when that department was really struggling. We were heavily in debt and, uh, they, they were constantly, uh, spending more money than they, than they had. And, and I feel, uh, I feel a sense of accomplishment in that we, we were able to get us back in the black. That was, that was my, my thing. My, my goal, I was elected into that position, um, as the district Sunday school, back in the black. That was my mentality. And, and I, I mean, I was pretty draconian. I mean, I was just like, okay, we're not doing this anymore. We're not doing that anymore. You know, cause, you know, when it boils down to it, if you don't have enough money, it's really all about budget. I mean, you got to work, you got to make money, don't get me wrong. But what I've discovered in life is it's really all about budget. And so I began to, I began to get involved and I, and I, we were, and, and, and we wanted to take it to the next level at the same time. And so we started, and I feel like I was there for several years and I feel like we did some things and I was proud of what we did. And then, uh, I was, it was time for me to step out of that position and let someone, uh, someone else take it. And, um, the secretary that we had at the time, uh, I, I felt like that, I felt like that was a good, a good choice and, uh, to, 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 to just keep it going. And, and now there's somebody else there. And you know what? They're doing things differently differently than I did. I question it sometimes. But you know what? It's okay. I'll be honest with you. There's been some times when they've had successes that I'm jealous of. Man. I wish I'd have thought of that. (laughs) Amen. But you see, someone else is there. But the reality is, is that it doesn't take away from anything that I did to, to, to enjoy the successes of somebody else. It's like, man, that's, that's, that's awesome. They're doing things a little bit different. They're giving away scholarships now to go to the camp, and, and, and we never were able to do that. Uh, but now they are, and it's awesome. It's great. It doesn't take away from what God has done with me to celebrate somebody else. And it doesn't take away from your worth to let somebody else shine and for you to be in their shadow. If we want to avoid strife and we want to avoid quarrels and arguments, we need to learn the value to value the strengths and the differences and yes, even the inadequacies of people. We need to have compassion for perceived inadequacies rather than contempt. When someone doesn't measure up to what we expect, maybe we should say, you know what, maybe God hasn't gifted them with that, rather than saying, they should know better. Maybe they just don't think the way you do. And so we, we, we decide to bless them with our opinion, and so we go and we say, you know what you really ought to do if you really want to be successful? And then they don't listen to you. Well, that ungrateful. I tried to tell them. It's their own funeral. You know what? Maybe they just don't have that giftedness. Pray for them. And if they never get it, guess what? The sun comes up tomorrow. Babies are born. Life goes on. Amen? If we want to recover the mistakes, if we want to recover from the mistakes, we need to have humility. As a congregational meeting, two young male professionals made a presentation to update the sanctuary sound system. You already know there's going to be conflict, don't you? I didn't, I just read the first statement of that story. Oh my goodness, update the sound system. And I just said two young professionals are making a presentation. Dear Lord Jesus, what was the pastor thinking? 
And so they're up there, and you know, you know how young people are with technology. They're just like whiz bang, and we can do this, and we can do that, and we got to get rid of all this crazy old stuff. Wait a minute, crazy old stuff? I installed that. <laughs> they don't care, man. They're just like so enamored with the cool stuff. Look at what you can do with this app. It's like amazing stuff. You can like control the whole world with it. <laughs> it's awesome. And so they're up there and they're doing their stuff and they begin fielding questions and a retired gentleman, a former engineer, oh, here it comes, former engineer. He challenged one of the presenters' use of a technical term. I don't remember the exact phrasing of the, so that sparked the fireworks, but the atmosphere in the fellowship hall, which had held the little tension, held a little bit of tension because of the sound system upgraded, involved a significant amount of money. Oh man, here we go. Sound system, young people, retired engineer, and money. This is a recipe for complete disaster. He, he, and, and he used the wrong term. And that old guy he's up there, he's like, oh, I got him now. And so there's tension and it starts to, fireworks start to, to fly and finally they kind of, they kind of barrel their way through it and they take a vote and they, uh, they, 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 they decide they're going to go forward with this, uh, with this upgrade and old man feels embarrassed and discussion kind of entered awkwardly. But then the old gentleman who had caused the conflict, he went up to the presenters and what was heard from the outside was an apology. I'm sorry for causing that conflict. Can I take you out to lunch? Huh. Humility. They went out to lunch, and everything was better. Conflicts and hurts. And so we need to humble ourselves in front of each other. We need to humble ourselves to God and recognize He's the giver of, of, of what we have and He's the taker of it too. He's the giver to other people and so we uh, humble ourselves to our brothers and our sisters and uh, yes, even our family members. Some of you can repent about that later. And then He says, resist the devil. Why in the middle of this instruction would He say resist the devil? Resist the devil and he's going to flee from you. Do you know why he said resist the devil? Because you see, the devil is the one who stirs up strife. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that accuses. He's the one that points out the flaws. He's the one that reminds us of the past. He's the one that does that. But unfortunately, sometimes you and I step into his role. And we do his work for him. The devil takes a day off, man. He's... <laughs> He's like me, lazy. Like, if you're going to do the work, go ahead. If you're going to pick apart these other people, go ahead. I ain't got to do nothing. When we start to accuse people, when we start to remind people of their past, when we bring up old hurts, oh, you know, now I'm meddling. Now I'm meddling in some of your marriages. Because some of you are at home and you start to have a conflict. And as soon as somebody says, you shouldn't have done that. Oh, well, well you think I shouldn't have done that. Well, guess what? Do you, re you probably don't remember 18 years ago when you said this. And we're starting to do the devil's work. We start to accuse and we start to attack. And we're saying, well, you think I've done this. You think I'm inadequate in this. Well, let me tell you, let me list all of the things. You're going to thank me later by pointing out all your flaws. Yeah, come on, church. You see, when you start to accuse, when you start to attack, when you start to bring up the past, when you start to uh, remind people of things that you supposedly forgave them for, you're doing the work of the devil. Don't do the devil's work, church. Look to encourage. Look to build up. Look to forgive. You know what? It's okay to forget some things conveniently. You know, I'm just not going to bring that up. So we look to build up instead. We look to restore. He says, resist the devil because the devil wants to tempt us with the, the satisfaction of pointing. I, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when I point out other people, when I see other people's flaws and I get the opportunity to point them out, oh man, that feeds my flesh. It feels so good to tell somebody off. To me. 
but it doesn't build relationship and it doesn't heal and it doesn't pro- and it and it and doesn't respect and it doesn't ha- it doesn't value God's creation. It feels good for a moment but we need to overcome that. We need to resist the devil. We need to resist the devil and we need to surround ourselves with godly influences in our life. Psalm chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path with sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. Uh, he shall be like a tree. I'm not talking about not having friends that, 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 that aren't in church. I'm not talking about that. We need to be friendly and we need to love people and we need to love sinners. But we don't sit in the seat with the scornful. We don't hang out with the, in the paths with sinners. We step away and we say, no, I'm not going to go do that. Yeah, I'm going to love you. I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, I'm going to hug your neck, but you're going to go do something sinful, I'm out, pal. I'm not going to walk in the paths of sinners. I'm not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. I'm not going to be the one that sits back and points out all the flaws like those two crazy people in the Muppets. You know those two old guys? I understand they're funny. I think they're hilarious. But they're puppets, okay? They're funny. But they also are kind of a caricature of what we become sometimes. Sitting in the seat of the scornful. (laughs) You see that? (laughs) You see Pastor Blaze stumbled over those words. (laughs) I can't believe it. Did you see that praise singer? They didn't even know the words of the songs. (laughs) That was pretty funny, right? It's hot, huh? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law he meditates day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who brings forth fruit in the season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Who are you listening to? What influences are you allowing in your life? Do your friends fan the flame of discontent, strife, and arguments, or do they promote godliness and contentment? Do your friends help you grow and improve your marriage relationship or are they sowing seeds of discontent? We need to get better friends that build us up and don't stand in the path with sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. If you find yourself in the seat of the scornful, if you find yourself in the path with sinners, get out. I'd like you to stand with me. Ask our musicians if they would come back to the platform. I asked the same question that I asked at the beginning today. Do you find yourself in strife? Are you constantly annoyed with those around you and you see all of their flaws even though other people don't? Do you feel like others are receiving more recognition than they deserve? Do you feel like every friendship you start just ends up in conflict and jealousy? Do you struggle to connect deeply and meaningfully with meaningfully with others because you just they just don't understand. They just don't get it. They don't understand your needs. Are you always disappointed in the lack of commitment that's given to you from your so-called friends? Are you always finding yourself in some kind of a conflict with someone, whether it's on the job or at church, maybe at school, in your neighborhood? Doesn't matter where you go, you're always in conflict. And you just don't understand, why is this always happening to me? Why does this keep happening? Everywhere I go! If you'd answered yes to any of these questions then this message was for you today. And the only fix for this difficulty is going to be found at an altar today. Maybe a private prayer closet. Maybe that time alone. But it's going to be found with God. See, your healing is going to be found in your friendship with Jesus Christ because He's the only one who can truly give any value. He's the only 
one who's able because he's the only creator that exists. He stands here waiting for you to come. Would you come let him heal you? I'm going to open up this altar. I'm going to ask you if you'd come and say, oh God, I need a, new, I need some, a touch from you. Is there something that pricks your heart? Is there some strife that you need to come, overcome? Would you just come and you find that place in God today? It's the only place you'll find it. He wants to take away the strife that's caused by the internal turmoil in your heart. He wants to let you know that you're His child. He loves you. You're the person of worth. And even while, even, even while at the same time He loves the person that you're comparing yourself with, He loves you and He loves them. And God can heal the whole process if you'll just let Him.